dear friends uh, this morning we had a very beautiful inaugural ceremony um each one of us was given a flag with one single letter of the english alphabet um, i received one uh, some of you also got it um well then the problem was i was wondering what does it all mean put together you know I was looking around to see the other letters and they are invisible they, they are all holding it like that um well uh, suddenly it occurred to me probably this is my experience the whole life i have just one letter and then with that letter i am trying to uh, you know go into all sorts of uh, things uh, of knowledge the condition of knowledge is and we need to be together now <laughs> pardon the lesson the lesson is that uh, ah okay we should we should all come together and show our flags so that we i got i got c it's there c <laughs> yes um, it's only very late yeah very uh, later i discovered of course that this is a academic retreat so thank you for that uh, illumination and insight <clears throat> now um i am asked to speak about a christian philosophical uh, approach to mind and matter uh, but uh, i should begin by saying that christianity did not begin as a philosophical system you are all aware of that it was rather a way of life advocating love forgiveness uh, fellowship uh, interpersonal and social relationship and so on and christ himself projected the image uh, of the utopian kingdom of god as the ideal condition in which justice and peace love and reconciliation are perfected so he appealed to people to repent uh, that is to turn around to experience a profound change of mind and attitude uh, that rejected evil and wholly embraced the good Uh, this is a first step towards entering a radically new order of life symbolized by the metaphor of the kingdom of god the sermon on the mount uh, jesus preached contained the guidelines for uh, for the new life for the new order of life um, thus the very early christian community lived a life of faith love hope simplicity sharing of material resources and the bore firm hope for the new order of life as promised by Christ but please don't compare that early christianity with what you see around now uh, i am also part of that uh, establishment christianity <clears throat> um now probably in the bible in the new testament uh, the only philosopher i would say is Paul whom you call Saint Paul uh, he was not born uh, uh, and brought up in Jerusalem the uh, the heartland of Judaism but he was born outside in the Greek world so he was a roman citizen with the greco roman culture he knew greek as well as his uh, liturgical language hebrew and aramaic <clears throat> but following Paul there was uh, a group of philosopher theologians from the greek tradition who accepted the christian faith like uh, justin martyr athenagoras of athens and so on they are known in the christian tradition as apologists because they defended the new faith which they accepted uh, over against the philosophers and logicians of the so called pagan uh, greek tradition um, but later on <coughs> things changed by the 4th century you know the mainstream of christianity was in the uh, roman uh, and byzantine empire and by the time of, uh, the learned christian theologians came up in the 4th century the old greek philosopher school uh, declined so the uh, newly emerging ascetic monastic community in the uh, in the palestinian is a uh, syrian egyptian uh, deserts uh, they claim that they are the philosophers but there is a 
a, a Greek background to that. We know that the Stoic philosophers deeply influenced the Christian monks because the, in Stoic philosophy, the idea of apathia, apathia is uh, detachment. In, in, in India, we can call it vairagya, huh? complete detachment from the material world, from possessions and positions. So this apathia idea influenced the Christian monks. So that for them was the essence of philosophy. To be a front of knowledge or to be a front of wisdom is to have apathia, to have complete detachment from the material world. So that is how Christian monks became so-called philosophers in, by the fourth century. <clears throat> Uh, what I wanted to tell you is that Christianity did not create any, any special philosophy as it was the way of life. And in psychology too, uh, I don't think Christianity made any uh, original uh, contribution. Of course, later on, in the case of St. Augustine others, you would see psychological insights going rather deep into human mind. But the most important thing was not a psychological analysis of the human person, but the the, the, the real conduct of life. Uh, now, I'm very happy that uh, Professor Tanga has uh, given this uh, vast uh, scenario of uh, Greek understanding of mind. Uh, this is behind early Christian tradition. So Christians generally accepted a tripartite uh, division of the human person, the body, mind and soul, but nobody knew what exactly soul was or mind was. And the Hebrew tradi tradition also had this idea of uh, three uh, elements of mind, body and soul. So that was generally accepted by all Christians. Uh, and also the uh, Neoplatonic, by the time by the Plotinus came, you have these two uh, realms of the noetic tradition, noetic realm and the aesthetic uh, realm, uh, the realm of the of news, of intellect, and aesthetic sense perception. So that again was a convenient division for people to understand uh, human psychology. <clears throat> but as I uh, mentioned, um, the ideas of Plato, Aristotle, and Stoics, uh, Pythagoras, these are all there behind the Christian understanding of uh, psychology. The most important thing uh, was the journey because there was a very clear uh, idea among early Christians that this world is not their home. They are pilgrims, they are traveling. Uh, so what the eschatological idea of the fulfillment in the kingdom of God, uh, kingdom of God that was what motivated many Christians. <coughs> Uh, I, I just checked the Stanford Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy. Uh, there's a very recent uh, entry in that in the last month. It, it says that no religious philosophy is uh, purely philosophical. Every religious philosophy is clearly uh, theological. And that applies to Christianity too. The, the, the problem is uh, people in the secular world uh, uh, tend to look down upon theology because it is subjective and sectarian very often. Right? <laughs> yes, it is subjective and sectarian. Uh, so, but unfortunately, I need to speak about Christian theology uh, because there is no real philosophy in the ordinary sense of, of that term. <clears throat> um, and then we know that uh, what I'm going to speak uh, is couched in uh, metaphorical, poetic language. There is no other way to speak about soul or God except in uh, poetic, analogical, metaphorical, uh, symbolic language. I think the Buddha was very wise in not in, in being silent about God and uh, uh, the soul because there is no way to articulate in, uh, by conceptual, by human concept or by language. <clears throat> um, uh, two uh, elements which come up in our prayers and uh, writings of the early teachers of faith uh, is 
one is wakefulness and it comes directly from jesus christ himself in the gospels uh, there are many parables which jesus says about wakefulness the master goes away and nobody knows when he would return and he can return at the middle of the night so the the people in the household should be wakeful uh, they cannot squander money they cannot uh, do uh, unlawful things they should always be wakeful because nobody knows when the master returns and the case of the the the, the ten virgins the ten, five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins the bridegroom is coming at any time of the uh, of the night so they have to have their lamps lit and so on so this is like and jesus again and again says be wakeful the idea of the jagrata is there but of course this is not to be taken literally i as an indian i consider that this idea of wakefulness uh, is very close to our indian understanding of being enlightened eh? so jesus was asking people to be enlightened and then uh, I, as i see in the liturgical tradition the word baptism uh, which we uh, now uh, use in a very often in a wrong sense had the, the synonym fortisma very early fortisma means enlightenment right? that is almost called fortisma so you enter into the realm of light you are being enlightened in your soul so that theme uh, goes very well with the ancient indian understanding particularly from the buddhist uh, tradition <clears throat> another psychological uh, dimension of the uh, writings of the fathers and the uh, liturgical tradition is memory memory is not a, a function of the brain memory is not a, a psychological uh, element as we take it very often memory is very comprehensive memory begins from the very moment of creation from the inorganic to the vegetative uh, to the animal kingdom to the homo sapiens the memory is come so uh, i am a priest when i celebrate the the uh, mass which we unlike the western people we don't call it mass we call it um, the eucharist thanksgiving or kurbana kurbana is uh, offering offering when i celebrate the early, the, the first prayers are about this memory where we remember all people who have done who have been virtuous from adam to the present day and there is no religion there is no caste and there is no um, <laughs> nationality you know uh, we uh, remember all those people who have done good from adam the first man adam and eve from adam and first man and first woman to this day and this memory is extremely important uh, it's not simply a, a segment uh, of, of of our mental activity but that which encompasses the whole creation uh, so that again is important in understanding uh, the, the the early christian uh, approach to mind now i come to another uh, point <coughs> the fundamental axiom for christian understanding of uh, mind and spirit is the biblical statement that human being is created in god's image in the book of genesis in the first book of the bible in the first chapter itself it says god created everything but out of his uh, will out of his love but when it comes to the human being it says god created human being it says both male and female eh? both male and female in god's image so the imago dei the image of god becomes fundamental for the christian understanding of the human person in theological uh, anthropology um, <clears throat> but here's a problem um, the the christian tradition like many other traditions of him that god or the transcendent uh, principle is spirit is immaterial is invisible so if god is spirit what does it mean uh, to uh, to to become the image of god it's not material here is the 
a logical uh, difficulty, the philosophical difficulty, that question is not solved. We simply say that God is spirit, but God's image is material uh, in body, mind and soul. Human beings uh, are to reflect God's quality. So theologians, uh, uh, in a way, uh, interpreted the imago dei, the image of God, in terms of spiritual qualities, like uh, freedom, particularly freedom, um, uh, goodness, uh, beauty, and, and so on. <clears throat> now, freedom or free will uh, is the pivotal characteristic of the image of God. Um, Paulus Mar Gregorius is known to some of you. <laughs> Here is Venerable uh, Dubum Tulku, who was a close friend of uh, Mar Gregorius. He was very closely associated with this, uh, this, with this center. <laughs> He was my mentor and a teacher, and he has spent uh, great uh, en energy on this idea of the freedom of the human being, freedom uh, in the image of God. And he has taken as his own mentor a fourth century philosopher theologian uh, whom he calls an ancient theologian. He was from Cappadocia in the, uh, uh, in the eastern part of Turkey today. Um, and Gregory of Nyssa is not well known in the Western world because he spoke, uh, wrote in Greek. Uh, the Western world, particularly St. Augustine later on in the 5th century, he didn't, knew, he didn't know, know, know Greek at all. He was uh, in the Latin, he was the sort of great uh, towering genius of the Latin uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, Gregory, my, my mentor Gregorius compares Augustine and Gregory of Nyssa. And he would say that uh, Augustine had a very low view of human freedom. He spoke instead of human depravity uh, and helplessness uh, and uh, a total, total, uh, as a humanity as a condemned mass, as a massa damnata, as he said in Latin. Uh, so, especially with this idea of the original sin, the whole Western tradition uh, was uh, uh, polluted, corrupted, according to Mar uh, Gregorius. Even in the secular tradition in the West, you have that problem still remaining. The idea of the original sin, which Augustine taught. But I tell you that none of the Eastern churches uh, accepted Augustine as their teacher, although he's such a towering intellectual. Instead, Gregorius Nyssa uh, always promoted the idea of freedom as the most important the aspect of God's image. Uh, probably I will read uh, just a sentence from him, from this fourth century philosopher theologian. <clears throat> the language of the scripture therefore expresses it concisely by a comprehensive phrase in saying that man was made in the image of God. For this is the same as to say God made human nature a participant in all good. For if the deity is the fullness of good, and this is his image, then the image finds its resemblance to the archetype in being filled with all good. Thus, there is in us the principle of excellence, virtue. Uh, professor has already mentioned that already. The principle of excellence, all virtue and wisdom and every higher thing that we conceive. And preeminent among all is that we are free from necessity and not in bondage to any natural power, but have the decision in our power as we please, for virtue is a voluntary thing, subject to no domination. That which is a result of compulsion and force cannot be virtue. Uh, that's a great uh, statement that virtue uh, uh, cannot be compelled, uh, that force cannot uh, create the good. Uh, maybe we can take it for our uh, reflection uh, on, on democracy and so on. Mm. Now we, again, to the best of our knowledge, the Homo sapiens, our, our species, is the only creature who can genuinely uh, be creative. While all other creatures are driven by instinctual impulses 
as required by circumstances. Human beings can create and transform their circumstances at will. We usually relate creativity with human activity in various fields like art, science, agriculture, technology, and so on. Uh, but classical thinkers like Grigory of Nyssa could understand human participation uh, in the good, uh, and there is no limit set for humanity's growth towards the good, since God is infinitely good. And that was the point. Uh, uh, they speak about spiritual growth, and there is no limit, uh, because God, to whom the soul uh, reaches out, is infinitely good. So, human beings are also infinite, the growth is infinite. It is interesting to uh, compare this idea with the new biomedical technology for human enhancement, uh, which is uh, sometimes uh, uh, terrifying how human technology, biotechnology is now creating uh, cyborgs and uh, robots and so on. And there, do we need, ethically, do we need some uh, limit? Uh, what is the summit of that, uh, the ceiling of that development and progress? But internally, there is absolutely no limit set for our enlightenment uh, and uh, illumination. The ontological source of human awareness is rooted in the transcendent reality and therefore a purely secular view of human freedom and creativity will not bear fruit in the long run. It uh, not only uh, doesn't create any good, but it will have a big problem for humanity, of ethical uh, crisis for humanity. Uh, very soon it's already there uh, in our world. Now, the classical Eastern Christian theology affirms that the image of God in humanity is meant to initiate a process of deification by which uh, we become godlike. The expression, the Greek expression is theosis. Theosis is a deification. So we are already in the process of uh, being uh, participant in God's nature. And some of the uh, writers, like Gary of Nasianzo would say, let me use a bold phrase, he would say, let me bold, uh, use a bold phrase, we become God. Now, Theon genestai is the Greek expression. Uh, we, be we are becoming God, Theon uh, genestai. Well, uh, now, uh, finally, Gregory of Nyssa looks at the emergence of, of human species as part of an evolutionary scheme based on the genesis narrative in which human beings are created at the very end of the creation, like uh, he would say, it's important because the first inorganic world was created and then the uh, vegetative life, the, the micro, the, the microorganisms were created and the vegetation came, the animals came, birds came and then the human being was created according to the Genesis narrative. Of course, he doesn't take it literally, but uh, in a way, metaphorically, he would say, why human being was created at the very end? Because human being uh, is uh, full of the energy of the whole material universe. So we are the, the great expression of the whole cosmic energy because we have become conscious. Because human beings have become conscious and self-conscious, uh, we can appropriate that energy and use this uh, for a great uh, creative um, effort. And this is a point of radical uh, liberation. Uh, and then there he uses the, the, uh, the, the, the physiological condition of our hands. You know, he says, well, uh, before us, the animals were walking, uh, even now the animals are walking on four legs. But what happened to the human person? A human person stood on two feet in the biological uh, evolution, evolution of the, of course, the Homo erectus is the, is the climax of that evolution. He, in the fourth century, says that uh, the two front legs were lifted and became our hands. So what happened? We became free. And we can manipulate, manus his hand, we can manipulate reality, which is 
I mean, techn technological, artistic, whatever. We can manipulate reality. But the most important thing is that we can turn our neck around and look up. You, know, you can look up and see the starry sky and then um, contemplate on that. Oh, what a great majestic thing is the starry sky and what is behind it. Uh, the whole uh, meditation uh, on, on the cosmos begins when we have uh, this homo erectus position, when, when, when our hands and our two legs became hands and our neck became flexible enough to, to look up and look around. Animals, instead they look down. <laughs> they look down to the earth, always in search of food. Eh? And they are, uh, their face is in a way pointed to the earth, but our face is more flat. Eh? We can now uh, have a different understanding of the universe. So again, this is a this is an important point of the image of God according to Gregory of Nyssa. Well, um, now I would uh, come to the two words which I used in my uh, title, anabasis and uh, metamorphosis. <coughs> well, anabasis simply means marching forward or climbing up. It was originally a martial term of the army marching forward, but Anabasis is simply marching forward, moving forward, or climbing up. Now, um, Gregory of Nyssa wrote a beautiful book, Life of Moses. You know, Moses in the Bible is the, the great leader of the uh, people of Israel, and who was the liberator. He liberated the people from the slavery under Pharaoh and took them to the promised land. But uh, he had a very interesting life experience. He was a slave child, born of uh, Hebraic uh, people working in uh, as slaves to Pharaoh, and building the great pyramids and so on. Uh, and they were persecuted at one point, tortured by the masters. So the mother of Moses, uh, hid him among the reeds in the uh, river Nile. Uh, and then, uh, well, she thought somebody would uh, save the child and uh, uh, bring it up. And the princess, uh, of uh, the daughter of Pharaoh, came for bathing in the, in the river Nile, and uh, she found this child. She heard the cry of the child, she, she found the child. And she was barren. She had no children. So she adopted this uh, child uh, and uh, Moses was brought up as a prince in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, they say in the Bible. Right? Uh, he was brought up in all the wisdom. You know, he was the, the, the top people uh, in terms of technology and other things. So he was brought up in the wisdom of the Egyptians. But later on, he recognized his own origin. He recognized uh, that uh, he was not an Egyptian. So he went away from the court and became a simple shepherd. While shepherding the sheep, he had a theophany. He had an experience uh, of, of, of a burning bush. Uh, a bush simply was burning, but the bush remained green. It was not burned. And then uh, it was a theophany for him. He, some of you know this story uh, from the Bible. Uh, well, he accepted it as God's revelation. Later on, he became the leader of the people of Israel, and he was leading the people out of Egypt uh, through the desert of Arabia for 40 years. And during that uh, uh, sojourn in the desert, uh, he had a pillar of cloud as God's, God's guidance. You know, first as bright light, but now in cloud, dim light. Uh, much later, when he went up the Mount Sinai to see God in person and also to receive the Ten Commandments, the book of Exodus says about that experience, Moses entered into thick darkness. Moses entered into thick darkness. Um, so what did he see in thick darkness? We don't know. But these three stages are taken by Gregory of Nyssa and also some of his fellow theologians in a metaphorical way. You see, if you are a good seeker, genuine seeker, you have 
sort of light experience, luminous experience at the beginning. But as you progress in your spiritual life, it becomes dim. The light becomes dimmer and dimmer. And finally, when you are really mature, which you do not know, then you are in total darkness. This is thick darkness, eh? pitch darkness. So he would say, this is an abasis. Moses climbing up the Mount Sinai eh? from the light to the dim light to the thick darkness. And the human soul, this, this speaks about particularly in the monastic ascetic tradition, you know. The inner human being who searches for the ultimate, the transcendent reality has to go through this experience of revelatory light at first, but less revelatory and uh, dimmer light and then darkness. So this is um, very close to the Indian idea, the Vedanta idea of uh, Neti Neti. What did Moses see on the summit of Mount Sinai? Nothing. Nothing. Is this Brahma? Not this. Neti. Is this Brahma? Not this. Neti. Is this God? Neti. neti. So that is the apophatic tradition. For uh, Eastern Christians, the apophatic tradition is more important than the uh, what they call the cataphatic positive affir affirmations about God. And the basis of that uh, apophaticism is this experience of Moses as interpreted by Gregory of Nyssa and other early theologians. There is also an important idea of epictasis in Greek. Epictasis simply means striving. Uh, so he is using an image of an athlete, uh, I mean, an athlete ready to run and waiting for the start signal. So he's already bent forward, uh, focusing on the very uh, uh, the goal. So that is epictasis. So we are also in the process of epictasis. Now, uh, to save time, I <coughs> I forego uh, many things and come to the final uh, metamorphosis or transfiguration. Now, if this is the situation of the inner person of spiritual growth going deeper and deeper, <coughs> there is the body. Here is the great Christian criticism of the Greek tradition, which they very much appreciated. You just heard from uh, Professor Tanga uh, that body is an obstacle for the mind to, to perceive greater things. Body is an obstacle. Huh? But here, uh, body is called a fellow servant, a homo doulos, a fellow servant of the spirit. So I think one of the important things Christianity uh, made in the Greek, Greek or Roman context is that body is not to be lost. Body is important. There is a separation between body and soul. Uh, that is a provisional separation at the time of death. But it will be reunited. Uh, so this is, body is called the fellow servant of the spirit. And the spirit of Christ is called the fellow servant of the body. They are together. There is no spirit without body. And there is no body without spirit. Uh, therefore, the, the theological basis, as I told you at the beginning, there is no way uh, avoiding theology here. The theological basis for Christians, early Christians, was that Jesus died on the cross. Uh, and his body and soul were separated. But uh, Christians affirmed the, the mystery of resurrection, which is a scandal which is scandalous in the, among the Greeks and the uh, Romans to say that Jesus was risen. <laughs> it, was, it, it was foolishness. Uh, but the foolishness of the cross and the foolishness of the resurrection is the basis here where the body is transfigured. After the resurrection, Jesus enters um, closed rooms. Jesus uh, appears to the uh, disciples. He eats with them. He also disappears. So th that is the situation. The body has become uh, very, in a way, it has, uh, it, it has abandoned its limiting conditions of space and time. It can go beyond space and time. It can also come back to space and time. So that was the great potential for the transfigured body. And the Christian tradition is also the glorified body. 
it is a luminous uh, body uh, so why uh, this is important in the in christian theology because they say matter the material universe is not to be uh, abandoned the material universe along with the human body will be transfigured well uh, as a as a teach as a student of theology i know this is again scandalous to tell people with some uh, rationality you can't speak but now i have a little uh, doubt in my own mind uh, you know i i i am in the uh, mahatma gandhi university where you have a very prominent nano scientist you know sabu thomas vice chancellor the well known uh, nano scientist uh, in nanotechnology what happens when you uh, cut down when you reduce the solid matter into an extremely small parts uh, its physical qualities change its color its uh, texture uh, its property all change it becomes something entirely different in nanotechnology and what happens in in nuclear uh, understanding when matter solid matter becomes pure energy uh, so between energy and matter which is part of the common place scientific knowledge for us we have already ideas of matter becoming pure energy uh, and uh, and physical things completely losing their property and becoming uh, something else so why not <laughs> that we are still uh, having one or two letters now with us so let us try to read the the whole at some point this is my personal uh, um, Uh, answer to the these questions so i am uh, com- coming to the conclusion anabasis and metamorphosis together provide a design for life that takes into serious account our major philosophical psychological and scientific questions however this life is not meant to be a stage of speculative philosophy logical debate or psychological analysis they are all very good but life is meant for progressive illumination of the united entity of body and soul of matter and mind thank you please, please use your uh, uh, the, the period of miracles i tell you um, jesus himself did not believe in miracles uh, and the uh, and he told people not to follow uh, a miracle worker uh, he clearly said that his miracles were for healing not uh, not to astound people but for healing uh, people came with some disease a leper came uh, or a, a, a woman uh, with a hemorrhage for for for, for, for 40 years came uh, and a, and a canaanite woman a non jewish woman a canaanite woman came Uh, to ask for help for a young daughter uh, who is sick jesus uh, healed people so he was a healer in a way and that healing is very often interpreted as miracles i tell you miracle is not the essence of christianity although some of our churches um, uh, to uh, particularly in roman catholic church i know to declare someone as a saint the litmus test is whether he was a wonder worker so he will they will bring some people to give witness that uh, uh, i have been uh, a witness of the miracle etc but uh, miracle is not only for healing only for uh, feeding um, uh, that soul so i i accept your question but um, this is what uh, my teachers have taught me that don't trust miracles Pardon? Is it the creation of medieval period? Creation? Of medieval, medieval period? Medieval. Ah, yes. Uh, well, not simply medieval. It has been there all the time. Even in Christ's time, Jesus uh, asked the people, Why do you follow me? Why do you follow me? You follow me because you were uh, satisfied with bread uh, yesterday. Uh, do you follow me for that? so even in jesus time he was uh, called as a miracle worker only very few people knew that uh, he was the true healer 
compassionate and himself jesus himself was tired uh, and hungry and thirsty and so on so that was a different uh, thing uh, yes in the medieval period if you take history in that way in the western medieval period which is also the dark period of the west the medieval period then you see many many miracles it's happening everywhere now also thank so you is there any difference between bible adopted by Uh, early Christians and after Christians and different. Uh, uh, well, I think. Well, uh, I think. Uh, no, I should confess. I think we yeah. should allow yeah. other. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes. I uh, wanted to ask: Is In, your not, is your church the same as the Greek Orthodox Church? And if so, what is the Greek Orthodox Church? Uh, no, I am not Greek Orthodox. Okay. I am uh, from the uh, Indian. Yeah. Uh, Kerala Church. We have a 2,000-year uh, tradition. We have been using Suryak uh, liturgy, Suryak uh, forms of worship, because of our ancient connections with the Middle East. Uh, you know, Malabar. So the Syrian Church is your church, the Syrian Pardon? Church. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. But when you say Syrian, we are Indians. But uh, Syrian because of the language and the liturgy which we use. Yes. So it is the the british people who called us uh, syrians because <laughs> they had to distinguish between the latin christians who were converted by francis uh, xavier and so on so in order to distinguish between the old christians of kerala and the other christians syrian christians latin christians and so on you know uh, sir yeah. uh, just one minute please uh, you heard it written that you just edited a volume of polos mar gregorios yeah I didn't get it. So I, I I told you I have a little okay. hearing problem. You, eh? uh, you you've written a book on Paulos Mar Gregorios. Yes, yes. So he's also from the Syrian Orthodox Church. He was. That's what I was wondering. That's what I was. Yes, wondering. yes, yes. No, is he uh, Greek Orthodox? Or no, 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 not at all. No, I am his I am his disciple and student. Uh, yes. No, he he was born in uh, Cochin. Uh, yes. And he died in India too. He was also a bishop in Delhi for some time, and he was uh, was a public intellectual, well known to uh, the uh, the uh, the generation, uh, early generations in JNU, Delhi University, in IIC. He was well known, well known as a as an intellectual. I see. And so there's a lot of similarity between your dress and the early beliefs and philosophies that you propounded yeah. and Islam. Is that yes. true? <laughs> I didn't again get it. Could you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Quite. Not, you. Talking, yes. yes. Uh, this is, uh, you know, because we had association with the Syriac Christians of the Middle East from Iraq, from Syria, and on. Uh, that was the Ottoman period. So uh, <laughs> you see, uh, some of our. Uh, clerical dress uh, is uh, similar to the uh, the dress of the Ottoman period, the cap, the the robe, and so on. You know, that's true. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. even is yeah, even Islam in minaret uh, the in the mosque, it is basically taken from the uh, Turkish that. Uh, Uh, that yeah. that uh, cathedral. Anyway, the next question. Yes, uh, please. So, is there any concept of repentance and hell under Christian belief? Repentance and hell. Uh, repentance. Yeah. Yeah. My question is twofold. Essentially. It is. Uh, could you please? Uh, repentance. Okay. Repentance and hell. Okay. And hell. 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 Yes, definitely. Uh, in the uh, preaching of Christ, uh, he was reflecting the uh, Jewish uh, religious uh, ideas, and uh, and in the in the Bible, uh, you have uh, the idea of the punishment, uh, and people uh, are supposed to do good. If they don't good, they will repent. That idea of punishment is there. So the idea of the hell is again uh, is an image, is a is a metaphor for punishment. Uh, okay. Definitely, it is there. But uh, some people take it literally, and some people take it uh, non uh, literally. Uh, that's it. So there is any physical place 
called hell as per christianity <laughs> physical place is a life after death life like after that. death uh-huh. yeah yes um, on the on the question of the life after death there is very uh, very clear teaching in christianity that our life will continue the okay. life will continue but uh, nobody has given any clear physical uh, uh, clear palace uh, uh, or something uh, outline of what that life is instead there is a sentence in the bible which says what is in store for us our eyes have been seen uh, our ears have been heard our heart uh, hasn't uh, contemplated so this is completely uh, uncertain not not uncertain completely uh, out of our uh, definition yes thank you yes, so much yes concept of hell belongs to indian Philosophy. Also, also. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Everywhere. There is no yeah. any philosophy yes. here. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay. Next, next question, question, please. Next oh. question. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. Actually, please. I had two questions. One is a little controversial. We may keep it aside. But uh, I, I also wanted to tell you that uh, I had heard Father Paulus Mas Gregorius. He had come to our Buddhist center, and he started really scolding us. Uh, we were supposed to be buddhist <laughs> in the 1990s be a little louder he is uh, hard hearing i yeah. had yeah. Met... i have this problem when your sound yeah. become uh, becomes blunted in, uh, when when it comes to me so, you know. yeah. no when i met uh, paulos paulos mars gregorius uh, in the 1990s he had come to our buddhist center and he started scolding us and saying where where in universities in india do you people even study your own literature which is nagarjuna and dharmakirti on logic and debate and things like that that's just an anecdote my question was you raised the period of uh, 4th century uh, ce christianity and you and i don't know if it was you i think it was you who spoke about going into the desert you know for uh, meditation and retreat many years in egypt in syria arabia and other places so is there is there a like a, a strain of asceticism in the syrian the church that you represent is there any um, uh, asceticism for purification things like that yes uh, yeah i, I... Uh, uh, my own uh, feeling is that the syrian christians were accepted in kerala uh, uh, when they came through along with the, mar- the the traders because we had the ancient seaports there primarily because of their ascetic practices because in india we were familiar with the indian sannyasis uh, how how they do the ascetic practices so when they came they also fasted a lot they had fasting without eating food and uh, many many other um, uh, ways of you know uh, <laughs> submitting one's body to uh, a disciplined uh, system uh, so that was very much appreciated by indian christians also so there is a combination of even that is very clear even today among some of our present ascetics a, a very clear merger between indian asceticism and the christian asceticism uh, uh, so they go together yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. one difference thing is that christian asceticism is often uh, uh, in a community based like in the buddhist tradition in the, mon- the monastery and the sangha the sangha of monks is important not simply an individual uh, ascetic here yeah. thanks indeed uh, uh, no